McCled and Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com. Marcia Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, seven years ago yesterday, the term BP became part of the local language. We'll look back at what precautions are being taken because of the oil spill. In Baton Rouge, legislators are looking for a cash flow while wrangling with the budget, taxes, and criminal justice. We'll examine that as well as the latest in the New Orleans mayor's race. Bumpy days ahead for Bourbon Street and what to do with the municipal auditorium. On stage for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4, Julia O'Donoghue, political reporter, NOLA.com, The Times-Picayune, and Jeff Adelson, reporter, The New Orleans Advocate. We go over to Julia first, because legislature's now been in session, what, a couple of weeks? And yeah, we just, has, yeah, I'm not, two weeks. And, and certainly there's... <laughs> real big business before them. It's been kind of quiet, but you say it's going to really start picking up, you think? Yeah, so on Monday we're supposed to start hearing uh, the testimony about the main uh, part of the governor's tax package. Um, no one expects it to go anywhere. I think that everyone thinks it's kind of dead on arrival. Let's, and let's talk about that a little bit, that main part, which is a business tax. And it, it is. The name is the commercial activities tax? Yeah, is it's that, the commercial that. activities tax, or some people are calling it the cat. Um, it is a tax on sales. So it actually works like a sales tax, but the person doing the selling pays the tax. Um, and initially, it was supposed to apply to like pretty much every kind of business, even LLCs, uh, your you know bodega or small grocery mm -hmm. store, your retail store, anything like that. Even stuff like legal, attorney work, things like that. Um, they kind of tried to fidget with it to make it more appealing, uh, particularly for like grocery stores and convenience stores that just do turn over a lot of product. But that has brought the amount of money the tax would bring in way down, mm -hmm. like by half. Down. And so, the, and the governor, and he, th this was a, a big part of his tax plan, and he's right. trying to do this to raise the money to avoid that so-called fiscal cliff, which we face right. next year when that extra sales tax expires. Right. Um, but there are, it seems to be a lot of opposition to this tax that the governor's proposing. Yeah, he didn't. Um, he only rolled it out about two weeks before we started session, which. Uh, I think a lot of legislators, including people that like him, uh, don't think was enough time. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people didn't know this was coming, and then they kind of got hit with it, and they haven't had time to kind of digest it. I guess he would say the Republicans had told him they would not go for an income tax hike or a return to Steli, and so he felt like he needed to go in another direction, and this is the other direction. There aren't that many big taxes that raise the type of money that he was looking for. So out, if you're not going to do sales tax or income tax, you have to do a new business tax. And he felt like this was the other option. And so it goes to committee hearing starting, what, Monday, is it? Is it's, scheduled, it's scheduled for Monday and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Given that everyone says it's going to die, I would hope it would get voted on on Monday. But, <laughs> you know, they could try to drag this out for a long, long time. Uh, in which case it'd be voted on on Tuesday. Yeah. So this is the old circular argument. First, there's no popular tax, so so, right. so no tax that's not going to have uh, opposition. Usually the one that has the least opposition is something like on hotels and motels, because people from out of the state pay that. Right. But then the hotel industry is, is critical of it. So if all the taxes get failed, then the next thing is, well, cut back on services, uh, which would be the Republican side of this. And then once you hear that, then people start complaining about losing services. So right. it goes round and round. Is there any one thing out there that people talked about, if one of them could do this, that maybe, maybe everybody would agree to this? Well, the only thing that there seems to be some tentative agreement to is broadening what they call broadening the base of the sales tax, so applying it to new things. Um, what's gotten a lot of attention is Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, those types of streaming services, but also um, accounting, uh, lawn care, 
uh, housekeeping services that we don't have a sales tax on right now, but Texas does. So there is some tentative consensus that maybe we need to extend that. I don't think that that is going to bring in the revenue that the governor thinks is needed when our sales tax comes down. So we would still have a hole. But in terms of things that people think, you know, might pass, that would be that would be among those things. But we'll see. Well, the governor's complained that the GOP, and the Republicans, don't have a plan. I mean, is right. a plan emerging on they that have, side other than just cut? <laughs> they have part of a plan. <laughs> they have. Um, well, so let's distinguish the the. Se the, when he talks about the Republicans, he's talking about the House Republicans. Mm -hmm. I think the Senate leadership thinks they might have gone along with Steli or an income tax uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they had kind of gotten themselves to a point where they could do that. Um, but that was never going to happen in the House. So they have a plan to sort of try to contain the budget. They haven't said where they're going to sort of contain stuff, so mm -hmm. where the cuts would come from. But in terms of taxes, no, they don't. They haven't really proposed a, a plan. There are some individuals who have some ideas, but it, a cohesive plan they don't have. So we have about six weeks left now to the session where they have to tackle some really serious Correct. budget issues. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're really facing a big deficit next year. Right. Then, of course, there's funding for tops. There's a whole lot more. And right. we will continue talking about this over the weeks. And there's a possibility of a special session after right. this after session if it doesn't happen soon. Right. All right, Julie, and there's more also that we're going to be talking about in this session when we come back to you in a little bit. But first, right now, I'm going to go over to Jeff because um, the New Orleans mayor's race is now it's starting to bubble up a little bit more. Starting to, to percolate mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, and we may very soon have uh, a pretty big development. Uh, Desiree Charbonnet has... Uh, indicated that she's resigning her judgeship uh, this afternoon. She's or this been evening. chief judge of municipal yeah. court. Mm -hmm. uh, chief judge of municipal court. Um, now she, she's been, her name's been thrown out there a lot as a potential candidate for mayor. The, um, but part of the rules of the court are that you can't uh, campaign for anything while you're a sitting judge. So this week uh, she put in her resignation uh, somewhat uh, unexpectedly. Um, which certainly seems to uh, to be suggesting that she's uh, she's going to be getting into this and, and could be a fairly uh, formidable candidate. Um, and so already Latoya Cantrell, Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell, mm -hmm. has announced, and then other names that are, are still out there as potentials are. Uh, well, um, we also had some uh, campaign finance reports this week, and Latoya Cantrell filed hers, a pretty strong showing. She's got about a uh, quarter million cash on hand. Uh, Michael Bagnaris filed his report. And then there was another uh, potential candidate, which, which is uh, Walt Leger. And Walt didn't have to, he's uh, uh, state, state rep, rep, speaker mm -hmm. pro tem uh, right now. He didn't have to file a campaign finance report unless he's running for something in October. Um, his report also shows a massive amount of expenditure on exactly the kind of infrastructure you would need if you were planning to run for mayor. Consultants, staff, opposition research, um, actually a substantial amount, mm -hmm. uh, about 21,000 on opposition research. Um, so that certainly signals that he's at least building and, and getting moving towards something. There's, there's a lot of other names out there, though. There's J.P. Morrell, state mm -hmm. senator. Um, there's uh, Karen Carter-Peterson Carter -Peterson is sort of uh, perennially mentioned and you know the uh, uh, those who are watching this sort of go back and forth on how how seriously she might be considering the race she just got a position with the DNC so that may also take mm -hmm. some time from her um, how, but, how do you establish the strength of a potential Charbonnet bid when she's not in politics per se obviously elected judges but it seems like they're in a different category in terms of measuring their strength politically. I actually think that's an, a very interesting aspect of her potential candidacy. She's, you know, not uh, she's not in city government the way most people think of it. So, you know, that's a positive and a negative. She's mm -hmm. so probably not as thought of in terms of the way council members or, or legislators right. are. 
Um, but that also gives her a little bit of sort of a fresh face. If people are sort of tired of the way politics is going, they may turn to her. She's also got a fairly substantial um, network through her family and uh, right. obviously a very well-known uh, family in, in and, and campaign and apparatus and, too, and, yeah. and, and she was what recorder of mortgages before, before she that, yeah. was just and, and, and as a candidate, she's been a strong candidate in the past oh, yeah. for her runs, and so it's also of interest that we have certainly one woman in for sure, mm -hmm. right. potentially two, two maybe even three right. yeah. for the mayor of the city of New Orleans. Oh yeah, and that's you know the city's never had a female mayor, so uh, it's interesting that and all three of these are pretty. Um, would would be pretty strong candidates mm -hmm. uh, if if they got in. So, um, you know that's that this might be uh, might be the year. <laughs> and certainly another name out there is Sidney Torres, so, and it came out this week that his uh, his business donated fifty thousand dollars to the Trump inauguration. How would that you think? I, I I think that does not play well with uh, <laughs> New Orleans electorate. Uh, only about fifteen percent of the city voted for Trump, um, and Torres, you know, he's he's sort of appealing to uh, a, an interesting demographic. He certainly could potentially run on kind of a law and order candidacy mm -hmm. based on his, uh, his patrols in the French mm -hmm. Quarter and stuff like that. How that plays with, with a lot of the city, I think, is going to have to, we're going to have to say. Qualifying ends in qualifying is in, in July. In, in July, okay. All right, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Over to David, and we um, we marked uh, the seventh anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the BP oil spill. Um, and you know, in those seven years. What have we seen in terms of containing oil spills? Yeah, I mean, I looked at that last night, and there's actually, uh, you know, the day that the rig exploded and killed 11 men was seven years ago, and then you actually have a slow fall of the rig into the Gulf and the beginning of the oil spill that then lasted three months. So yeah. this whole period now is the seventh anniversary. And it's different than, you know, a lot of the legal issues, the billions in payments and all of that, and the changes, regulatory changes have been made already. So that I looked at that in the fifth anniversary. But some new things are developing in spill containment and cleanup operations. And so I wanted to take a look at that. I went down to Leeville, and there's a operation there called Clean Gulf associates that's contracted by about 99 percent of the oil companies that operate in the Gulf and are on standby. They have eight locations across the whole Gulf Coast really blanketing the coastline so that they can get quickly to any number of well sites or uh, pipelines that may be leaking. And the other aspect of this is that I found that the number of spills are they're constant, and there's about four per day uh, That's pretty if you take the whole seven year period since the Deepwater that Horizon. Spills and leaks, do leaks Spills coffee? and leaks, that's including mm -hmm. all of them in terms of incidents where oil goes into the water. And they're, you know, none of them are on the scale of Deepwater Horizon, not even close. But, uh, you know, a lot of them are kind of 10,000 gallons or less, which when you compare to 200 million gallons from mm -hmm. the BP spill, it's mm -hmm. not even, you know, it's night and day. But these are issues where about a dozen spills a year or more require major, clean, you know, some kind of cleanup operation in order to try to gather it because it's thick enough. And then you have this one case there where there's a well that's been leaking for 13 years. That's the Taylor Energy spill. And we went back out there and got fresh video of that. And it is brown crude right there mm -hmm. in the slick. It's not just a thin rainbow sheen. So they're letting that, and they're saying that could be leaking for another 100 years until the reservoir runs dry. And so the, the idea that the industry really had to address these problems. They were pushed, of course, by the government, which said, now you have to have a spill response plan in place in order to drill. And so it wasn't just their benevolence. And, and, but they recognized that they were not prepared for what they faced with Deepwater Horizon if you got a big gusher. And they've got to be better prepared. And they were, and, they've and done so that. You, you featured some new technology that's out there, too, the, the, the booms that, that soak up the oil. I mean, there's just been new development in these right. years. Well, they had the boom before. 
for, but they didn't have it at the ready, and mm -hmm. they had to wait a long time to order it from Indiana and other places, and it was just a, that was a big mess in terms of responding quickly enough. And then there are new technologies for deploying it. There's a spool that's a patented technology that allowed them to take about five miles of boom on a barge and immediately deploy it. They create, they've got new 95-foot vessels that are fast moving and can go into the deep water and can contain 10,000 gallons of oily water mixture once they collect it. They got oleophilic uh, brushes that are able to push the oil in and, and do it in a more contained fashion. And then they are using infrared cameras and other technology to be able to operate at night and gyro stabilizers to keep the ship steady in high seas, the, uh, both things that really hindered them during the Deepwater Horizon reaction. So are response. we better prepared to handle these leaks, spills, catastrophes? I think it's clear with $100 million invested in this operation over this time, it's clear that they're better prepared to respond more quickly and to do so more thoroughly. But the question is, are we safer in terms of preventing them? And mm -hmm. that's that's a sliding scale of safety. You're never going to have 100% certainty that you're going to avoid this kind of accident again. And that's a whole other discussion, too, right. about regulation and inspection and et cetera. Right. All right, David, thanks so much. Going over now to Errol and Municipal Auditorium, um, it's been out of service uh, since Hurricane Katrina, but there have been some people living in it, apparently. Yeah, they, they weren't supposed to. Uh, there have been a lot of complaints about people who were breaking in, and a neighborhood activist named Leo Watermeyer had been uh, keeping up with it and sending photos of uh, doors that had been broken open. And so yesterday the city set out an announcement saying, okay, the building is secured now. They put steel sheets wherever there was an open door or an open window, and so they seem convinced that we're not going to have that problem anymore. The larger problem is what to do at the auditorium, which has been uh, been closed since uh, since Katrina. Uh, the first issue was getting money. The, the, they managed to wrangle uh, seven million dollars from FEMA, and he said, "Well, <laughs> that's nice, but we need 80 million." Uh, and so the, uh, uh, they had a hearing, and they got like 41 million. So they're still not even halfway there, and so they're, they're trying to have more arbitration. And so they say in their announcement, which is a little bit more revealing than most announcements, that when they get to this point where they think that the building is in a good enough condition to try to do something with it, then they're going to start the same negotiating process. They use as an example the, uh, the St. Rock Market and the World Trade Center uh, to find a, a way to put this building back into commercial use. Uh, the fact that they used those two examples, one was a market, one was a hotel, what they didn't mention was a theater. And I think this is another sign that probably uh, that building is, is not going to re return back as a performance space. For one, we probably don't need it as a performance space. We're, uh, there's probably an abundance of theater space uh, in New Orleans right now, and, and a lot of it more more modern. And, well, and, and, and so, a lot of it's right there, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how about high school graduations? That's where I had my high school graduation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what okay. you so, and, 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 and of course, the classic and most famous use was carnival balls, which was a wonderful place for but that's not enough to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. uh, neither is high school, uh, uh, high school <laughs> right. graduation. Of course not. And so uh, I don't think that's happened. Yeah, yeah, there were many graduations were there. Hank Williams got married in, in that building twice. Really? Uh, <laughs> his, uh, his, second wife, or, <laughs> his second wife, he married her on a Saturday matinee. It was so popular, they did it again on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it, uh, it is a building with a, uh, with a history. But I really Benny don't Gruden think the administration, for good reason, knows exactly where to go with it, and it's probably offhand. So they probably have to wind up being some sort of a multi-purpose facility, yeah. which so many things are. You know, they've been talk about having a, uh, some sort of a, a museum, a museum of jazz history or something. Benny Goodman opened that place, I believe, the first show there in 1930 hmm. or something. Wow. It's quite yeah. a history here. But, I mean, first off, we've got to, to secure the building and then get the necessary immediate repairs to it. When, do, when will arbitration start? I know you did some reporting. Um, our, the, there hasn't been sort of a firm date mm -hmm. for arbitration. In March, they got sort of the final sign-off from FEMA that they needed to go and begin the arbitration process. Based on some previous timelines the city uh, has laid out, we're probably looking at some time 
by early fall or mm, so. Still a while. Um, and, and then they, they are talking about a, uh, a market study that's going to sort of determine mm -hmm. which of those private firm, you know, what type of private firm they're going to go to. Once again, the building is being secured. Secured, yeah. Okay. And, and, and as a the theater facility, it's a good space because it has, actually has two theaters, two sides to it, the St. Yeah. Anne side and the St. Peter side. And it also has, you know, uh, decent parking ability. And so if it was working, if it was thriving, it could be a real asset. But there's just a lot of competition. It's just a different environment now uh, than it was before. Okay, we'll see how that progresses. Over to Julia now. <clears throat> and that other um, big topic that's before the legislature, and it's got both the supporters and the opponents, is criminal justice reform right. to reduce our incarceration rate. And there was a task force that came up with multiple suggestions, and, and a lot of it is toward taking a look at the nonviolent offenders right. and releasing them perhaps earlier. Right. Or just revisiting their sentences. Um, and then also making sort of changes in the, 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 the felony schedule, et cetera. Um, right. How is that going over? Um, I think people are still continuing to be a little bit optimistic about that. I think the, the big key, so the, the governor has a package of 10 bills, the two most controversial bills or I'm sorry, three. Two of them are being carried by the Senate president. John Alario doesn't carry criminal justice bills or really many bills, period. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a shot across the bow at the district attorneys and other people who are who are not taking this seriously. And the sheriffs also came and out the against sheriffs, it. Right. The, sh the district attorneys actually came out against most things and then revisited this week and came out sort of in a amended fashion mm -hmm. against some things. The sheriffs have come out against certain things as well. That was this week. They kind of officially came out and made a statement. Um, I think the key to get in, getting anything done is the sheriffs being willing to go along with some things that the governor wants to do. Um, the sheriffs have a lot of financial interest in us having a big prison population. Mm -hmm. Uh, not necessarily our sheriffs down here, but North Louisiana sheriffs in rural areas house a lot of state prisoners, uh, get paid when they work out mm -hmm. in the community and, you know, get paid for their housing and stuff. Um, I think there's some hope that the sheriffs are going to get on board with some of this because the governor has made it very clear that he will compensate them. Uh, at least for a little while for their losses and that people who have built bigger jails to accommodate hundreds of state prisoners uh, will not be left without money mm -hmm. to pay off their debt. Uh, but they're, you know, they're, it's going to be tough. <laughs> well, because there is also <clears throat> strong support coming right. for these reforms for and sure. coming from a coalition that one would not know, uh, ordinarily right. expect business and an, an activist and reformers coming together saying we need to do this. Right. The, bu the business community has gotten behind this uh, recently. Um, the conservative Christian lobby, Louisiana Family Forum, has really gotten behind this. Uh, we got a bill out last year, not we, but uh, the legislature mm -hmm. got a bill out to ban the box in state employment. Mm -hmm. It only got out of the House because the Black Caucus and the conservative Christian, not mm -hmm. caucus, but group of legislators came together and, and voted it out. So, so you know, they're, th this, they, they only need a little over half. So if they can get it together, they will, they'll get something done. Well, this is an effort that's been really three or four years in the yeah. making. So, so we'll see uh, how it moves through the legislature. Thanks, Julia. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Bourbon Street's coming in for some, yes. some fixing up. Uh, work starts on Monday for a uh, complete reconstruction, which means they're going to be uh, going down all the way to um, not just the street, but all the pipes underneath. Um, completely redoing uh, the first uh, eight blocks of bourbon from canal all the way in. It's going to be um, white? The, uh, it's going to be uh, as eight inches of asphalt, uh, not asphalt, excuse me, concrete on okay. top. The mock-up, the mock yeah. I don't know, it just looked weird. It, it's, uh, they say they're, they're using concrete mainly because it can withstand the, uh, the chemicals they use to, uh, to clean it better. Uh, and they think it's going to be a Disney be fresh. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 really so why, why, why this big focus on Bourbon Street? I mean, there is some other work that's going to be going mm -hmm. on around the French Quarter, but, but why this big focus on Bourbon Street? Which is um, well, the uh, so 
There's a focus on Bourbon Street for a couple reasons. Um, one, this is technically being funded uh, largely through the uh, the, the mayor's uh, forty million dollar mm -hmm. security plan. Bourbon Street's obviously at the center of mm -hmm. that security plan. Um, it's also Bourbon Street uh, is those eight blocks are all rated as poor or very poor by the city's uh, roadway analysis. Uh, that can be said about a lot of streets in the yeah. quarter, but uh, obviously this is a pretty big focus. The mayor's also um, been talking about trying to uh, trying to turn the street into a pedestrian mall and turn it into kind of a you know outdoor cafe kind of environment rather than uh, the way it currently is, uh, and this sort of all ties in um, with that. That that idea has has generated a lot of opposition mm -hmm. from from both residents and and businesses, uh, and businesses there. Right. Um, so, you know, this is all going to kick off uh, pretty soon. They're going to be. Uh, it kicks off next week. Yeah, right? it starts, yeah. and and it is going to be you know like block by by block. It's not going to be all eight blocks. No, at one no, time. they're doing two blocks at a time, and they kind of <coughs> leapfrog down down the street. Mm -hmm. um, and they are taking breaks for some of the big festivals, although obviously they're uh, getting started. Uh, they're getting right started the first week fest. of Jazz Fest. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be in the first two blocks. Two, uh, uh, the first and the third. First block. and the third block. Yeah, around, off of uh, off of Canal Street. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so you know, you're talking about the concrete on the surface, but they're dealing with the pipes and stuff underneath, which apparently have been touched since uh, 1928 19, or something. There, there like have that? been mi more minor repairs now, since then. I can then, recall but, seeing but Bourbon Street real. dug up on time, <laughs> yeah. time again. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first time they've been doing, going to do sort of a full reconstruction. Really get in there, replace most of the pipes. Uh, the the first pipes were actually put in by a predecessor company to Bow Brothers. So mm. uh, that's how. Uh, that's going way back. How old? Yeah. yeah. And so um, sidewalks are going to be also part of this as well? Uh, they're going to be different? fixing up the sidewalks okay. uh, anywhere that there are problems. They're, the sidewalks aren't the main uh, main focus, but the idea is to kind of get it all uh, back into decent shape. You know, you know, the famous French Quarter Street repair story was in, in 82 when the city fixed up the streets in preparation for the 84 World's Fair, and they just had to chop up the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. And all the businesses were complaining about the loss of business. And the mayor, Dutch Morial, said, look, you all just hang through it when it's done. I promise we'll create a festival every year to bring local people back here. So it was as an appeasement that Moriel promised what became the French Quarter Festival. And it began, and it was at the time people said, yeah, sure, a big deal. But he put his resources behind it as mayor, and it became, it did become a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get a cleaner, smoother Bourbon Street coming up. All right, <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> time to look ahead. Errol. Week from Wednesday, the uh, Condor Airlines begins its, its nonstop flights between New Orleans and Frankfurt. So it'll be two flights a week uh, from May through September. And so this will be, within a couple of months, two international airlines, you know, presenting nonstop service to Europe. So. So a sign that we're growing up as an air destination. <laughs> okay, very good. David. Well, I'm glad Julia's watching our money up in Baton Rouge because I found a $20 million mistake from the past in state spending, and I'll have that story Thursday coming That's up next week. That's a big mistake, David. It $20 is. Million. Okay. Julia. This isn't so much a look ahead, but things that we're not going to see during the session. Uh, we are the only state in the Deep South that doesn't have a bill that LGBT advocates don't like. Mm -hmm. um, most other states either have a, um, a, a religious freedom bill or a transgender bathroom bill. So we um, for whatever reason, we, we don't bill, no, they can't file any more bills right, and no so bill done. like that has been filed. We so. like getting all-star okay. games because yeah. of the other people's I history. think that probably has something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we have enough other controversies. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. Jeff. Uh, air rights, which we've discussed on uh, the show before, mm -hmm. is coming up before uh, City Council Committee on Monday. So if you're worried about your balconies and porches, uh, stay tuned. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. The firm of Bowen, McCled and Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com.